It is here. Our long spring nightmare is almost over. The spring game is almost upon us. I am Mike Schaefer, joined by Michael Brunch, Brian Christopherson. We are Husker 24-7, and we're here to talk to you about Nebraska's spring game coming up on Saturday. And we'll dive into a little basketball as well here on the Husker 24-7 podcast. Gentlemen, I, I want to start with a very simple question. What is your first memory of a Nebraska spring game? Like if someone just says red, white game, what's the first thing you think of? It's not my first memory, but I think of Bobby Newcomb uh, going about 92 yards for a touchdown. Is that 1998? Yeah. And uh, everybody's like, that's the man. There you go. They're going to keep rolling. And uh, that's like the one that stands out the most to me. Um, since the turn of the century, it might be Jamal Turner flipping into the end zone and everybody decided he was Deshaun Jackson for a little bit, uh, but he wasn't quite, um, stuff like that kind of pops in my head right away. I remember, uh, my, <laughs> a couple, um, was the, the spring game where Joe Daly was getting blitzed, um, <laughs> by, the by sabotaging Nebraska. of their own quarterback. Yeah, where where it seemed like the fix the fix might have been in a little bit. Um, that that one stands out. Um, that same the same game that that Brian was referring to, um, taking the red eye back to Lincoln or to Omaha, and uh, Breon Carnes uh, winning a Heisman that day <laughs> as well. That stands out. Um, chiefly among them did, did team jack run uh that yeah. that jack hoffman that that run will always stand out and just the absurdity of the cat um with bo polini which <laughs> i don't know but like if you had to like if somebody had never seen the sport of football and you explained to them that somebody came out of a tunnel in a stadium full of people the cat and just held it up you 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 would get a lot of question looks for good reason yeah no i i think that's fair i uh i'm always partial to the one that was rained out because it would provided some of the more interesting recruiting updates like brunts didn't you end up parking right next to the vehicle that had like jaleel okafor and all of those basketball players that were in town yeah we (laughs) yeah it was uh what happened was they were like getting gas and it was just like this van full of like five star players. Just <laughs> that are out. all really tall. Like that's the thing about basketball players when you interview them is you know they're tall, and yet it always disarms me a little bit. Yeah, and it was just kind of like, huh. Well, that's going to be. It. it was early in the day too. It was before the game was canceled, so it was just like started things off crazy. But yeah. Yeah, that one always stands out. Brendan Radley Hiles with the the baseball uh, uniform that set off that craze. If you remember that, he showed up to the spring game and he had like a Nebraska baseball jersey on, and then everybody wanted it. And Adidas like sold out of it within the first five minutes of putting it on its website. Uh, that one. They've had some random commitments. You remember Manuel Allen? He committed during the spring game, like during the actual spring game. Um, and then I don't know that he ever played college football anywhere. Um, Marquis, Mar- the Beeson kid that ended up at Illinois randomly yeah. committed and then decommitted like a week later. Yeah, and then they thought that that might also lead to Calvin Ashley, who Nebraska never ended up with, who could have been a nice tag team partner for Damian Daniels in the middle of Nebraska's defensive line. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's been some interesting ones here recently. You reminded us on the on – the, uh, the group text the other day that there was a spring game that was just the NCAA football game. Yeah. With former <laughs> legends and, and to, current players and whatever else. It, it's, it seems like ages ago that we were all very happy that Nebraska was broadcasting an NCAA football game. Um, <laughs> video game. That, yeah. That as, as much as some people don't like the spring game, thinking of you here, Schaefer, uh, oh yeah! Any Definitely. any any live football is better than sitting around watching uh, a, a stream of a video game. Hundred percent agree. I do not want to return to April of 2020 
at any point in my life. So I, I hundred percent agree there. All right. I want to, I want to ask you guys a few questions. Uh, just pick your brains a little bit. BC, give me the name of one player that you are convinced will score a touchdown on Saturday. Anthony Grant. Uh, I think he's had a really good spring. Uh, I think his elusiveness will be on display. And uh, from everything we've heard, they've been uh, sort of running the ball at will. Uh, the D-line is thin. Just feels like a day where two or three running backs are going to try to one-up each other with big uh, big plays. Brunch, you got a name for us? I'll be shocked if Brody Belt doesn't score a touchdown <laughs> on Saturday. Would be Brody Belt's second career spring game touchdown. He, he He's looking to back up last year's effort in the spring game. And I mean, we've, we have heard Brody Belt's name a lot the, the spring. So I think, and I don't think it's going to be one of those, you guys know what, how it is where it's like a, a guy goes off in a spring game and you never hear from him until the next year's spring game. I think Brody Belt's going to have some kind of role uh, in the offense. And I, I think he's going to, uh, he's going to score on Saturday. Put me down for Trey Palmer. I think Nebraska is going to try to uh, create one big play or two for Trey Palmer in the first half. Get people excited about the Casey Thompson Trey Palmer connection there. So I will I will go with the the new addition wide receiver from LSU. All right. So those are guys that we think could end up scoring. Who's a player BC you're just excited to put eyes on? One of the interesting things about this spring. We haven't been to a practice. We haven't even been to like the 15 minutes where you watch guys stretch and run and warm up lines. This is the least that we've seen from Nebraska in a full spring in some years. And so there's a ton of newcomers, but there's some intriguing returning guys too. Who's someone you want to see that you just want to get eyes on that mm -hmm. maybe you're going to go to the field level early on Saturday to watch them go through warm ups? Who stands out for you in that regard? Well, I'm going to assume, you know, that I'm just going to take Casey Thompson away. Yeah, no quarterback the answers yeah. here. Quarterback although, although, a quick thought on that. It's pretty fascinating uh, in this spring where you have new QBs here. It, there hasn't really been a lot of talk about. Uh, it's just like, yeah, that's Casey Thompson's job, and, <laughs> and, we, and we've moved along. So that's kind of an interesting thing. But uh, Jamari Butler, I think he's a – if you're looking for a defender who – uh, could have a, a big day and I think has had uh, the type of spring they wanted from him. Uh, I don't know that he's a starter at this point yet. You've got some guys in front of him that are experienced players and your Nelsons and your Caleb Tanners, but Jamari uh, is definitely like an up and comer in this program. And I wouldn't be surprised if he plays a lot of snaps and does some things. Brooks. Yeah. I, it's gotta be like a skill position type player. Because I, I, I Runs think hates the offense and defensive lines. That's true. Um, with the passions of a thousand sons, um, I think I'm eager to see what 2022 spring jockey ant looks like on the field. Because last year was just up and down with him. Um, we've heard from him. We've heard from Brian Applewhite. We've heard from a number of coaches that. Uh, Jacquez Yant is much more focused um, that, that he's in a, a different place uh, from where he was last season. And, you know, I, I'm eager to see what he brings to the table. Um, you know, when we got a chance to talk to him, he looked like he had slimmed down some. He looked like he'd been putting in a ton of weight in the weight room. And I want to see how that translates to the field, because I think no matter who emerges from that that running back group and i think probably right now if you were setting odds i, I think anthony grant's probably towards the front of that group i think jacques yant is going to be the kind of the the thunder um portion of whatever combo they're able to come up with so i'm eager to see what he looks like if the shiftiness is there if what nebraska is trying to do offensively and i don't think we're going to see a huge amount of variation in scheme and what nebraska shows but whether or not that fits him better than what they were doing last year, because I have a hunch that it does. I'm going to go with Elante Brown. I mean, he was one of the first names talked about way back at the early spring press conference. I know Mickey Joseph has referred to him as someone that he's excited to, to get out there to, to see play. 
And that's a guy that we've heard quite a bit on throughout the course of what he's done at practice or just impressing with his athleticism. I want to see it in a bit of a game atmosphere on Saturday. And so I, I think Alante Brown, I'll certainly be keeping an eye on uh, and, and just to see kind of how they use him and, and what he can kind of bring from a skill perspective uh, to a wide receiver room that is yet again in a transition. And it's hard to know. There's times where it feels like they've got, a pretty strong group and yet it also feels like one or two injuries could really leave them hurting and so the wide receivers continue to be a really fascinating group as a whole for me and, and Elante Brown is a big part of that all right so none of us mentioned either the offense or the defensive lines that's going to be a big part of this game on Saturday what what expectation or I well maybe not expectation BC, who do you expect, I guess, to see up front early for Nebraska's offensive line, kind of the unofficial top line of that depth chart, if you would? Uh, that's a tough one. Um, you know, without Corcoran and Teddy Prohaska, it's sort of been a guessing game. I think Trent Hickson has had a, a strong spring at center, so I wouldn't be surprised if he's first up there. I think probably if you say, okay, who's one guy – and this counts Corcoran and Prohaska, who you think is most locked into a spot, I would say uh, Nuri at left guard, um, unless I get surprised there on Saturday. I think he's been at left guard throughout the spring and, and would say him. I am I'm intrigued by um, where Kevin Williams and Hunter Anthony fit. Like, if – one of them is in the front line. I wouldn't be surprised if like Kevin Williams is maybe like in the interior. I don't know. And uh, I, th I would guess Brant Banks would be maybe up with the first group right now um, at one of the tackle spots. And then of course, uh, yeah, Ben Hart, who really nobody's talked about, um, but um, that's okay. If he's having a good spring behind the scenes. So I guess my biggest interest is sort of, uh, is the Kevin Williams, Hunter Anthony, but I think Brunson's opinion on it, I, I totally get. It's one of those things where people like to talk up like, oh yeah, I'm going to go into this and be Mr. Football and break down, you know, like the right guard. And I, I find some of that to be kind of nonsense about this spring game, to be honest. Most people just follow the ball. And I think uh, that's 98% of the audience. I would, I would consider you Mr. Football. Definitely. Oh yeah, that's definitely but me. But I, I mean, it's <laughs> I, it's going to be I, I my my hatred of defensive and offensive line aside, I, I do think it's going to be a little bit. The big question I think coming out of Saturday is going to be the 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 cause and effect thing. Like, is is the offensive line taking that big of a step, or is it the seven person defensive line with Ty Robinson that says he feels like he's 34, 35? If that which is it? And I, I think people are going to take the view based on kind of how they are approaching this team in this season right now. I mean, I, I think there's going to be some people that are going to say, well, the offensive line is firing off the ball. They look different and they may, I mean, that, that that's what Brant Banks has said. Uh, and he said, we'll see it. So be looking for it. But um, you know, and, and, and on the other hand, you're going to say, well, you know, Nebraska is really limited defensive line wise. They don't have a ton of depth there. Um, that's a cause for concern. I, I think it can be a little bit from both columns, but I, I, I don't know that that's going – either of those questions are going to be definitively settled until they're playing against Northwestern. It's just going to be this this kind of fodder, I think, for conversation for the next however many months until fall camp starts. So look forward to that. But, um, you know, I, I, I do think that – offensive line wise that they at least have a few more options than, than actionable options and maybe what they had at the end of last season. And that, and that's even without Corcoran in there. I want to, I want to get some eyes definitely on Henry Lutovsky. I mean, that's someone that I have been excited about for uh, really since he committed to Nebraska. I think that he has a chance to be a redshirt freshman offensive lineman that has a starting spot. And so he's going to have to go earn that and, and take, uh, from someone else at, at probably right guard. Um, but I I am really intrigued by what I have heard about Litovsky behind the scenes and certainly my own thoughts on him. And so I, I'm definitely going to be keeping an eye on that. And then BC hit on something that has been kind of curious this spring. And I don't know if it's good or bad, 
but no one has talked about Bryce Benhart at all. And he does seem like someone that you want to pay a little attention to because if Donovan Rayola is able to unlock something, I know it's hard for people to remember this, but we're talking about a guy that was a top 70 player in the 2019 class. Like there is, he was a highly regarded offensive lineman that was being sought after by pretty much the who's who of Midwest offensive line recruiting with Notre Dame and, and Wisconsin, Minnesota was in there. I think Michigan had made an offer. Tennessee had gotten involved. Uh, so this was someone that was really highly regarded. He had a bad year last year, but if he can bounce back and if Donovan Rayola can unlock something with him uh, to maybe get him to be a little quicker with that first strike, there's, I think there's some hope for some real uh, improvement within the actual players themselves and not just having to plug and play somebody and hope that that changes your offensive line too. So I, I definitely want to keep an eye on Bryce Benhart. Anything else you guys want to throw in? We'll, of course, have an opportunity to talk about Nebraska's spring game one more time on the Husker Hypecast. But anything else you want to get in here today about where Nebraska football sits uh, just a few days away from the spring game? I think I think the Ben Hart conversation is interesting because he's actually the perfect example of like what really – we always talk about this new guy and that new guy. But I think for Nebraska football to really – take a huge jump it is guys he's that category of player we're talking about like can you develop a guy um who's who you think has all this potential and we haven't quite seen it max out or get to that close to that level yet um so i i really it's as we were talking that out it's really wild to me that he hasn't like come up at all but yet he is such a key part of this whole discussion of if this O-line is what everybody wants it to be. No doubt about it. Brunch, you got thoughts on Ben Hart? It, it, I think you guys hit on it pretty well. I mean, I, I think he is that kind of guy that there, there, it seems like there should be a lot more for him out there. And I think he might be a guy that might just benefit from a kind of a different approach um, to teaching or, you know, how, how you're going to, you know, block run plays or or pass pro or whatever. So I, I I mean, he's, there's a few guys like that on the roster where you you feel like, you know, when they came into the program, you thought that they were going to be on a real upward trajectory, but they seem to have plateaued a little bit. So we'll see if, um, you know, these, these new coaches can kind of bring a little bit more out of them than what they've, they've shown in the past. All right, let's shift over to basketball, where Nebraska, Fred Hoiberg hired a new assistant coach from South Alabama, Adam Howard. I know very little about him. Uh, what? Uh, which Which one of you wants to dive in on Adam Howard as we talk Nebraska hoops here? Who's putting their hand up? Big race between BC and Brunts. Who's doing it? So far, nobody. I can, I can, I can talk oh, about him a little bit. Tentative, uh, tentative volunteering. No, no. I, Ryan I, Christopherson. I went over to himself. Yeah, I went over to the the thing the other day. He, they had a press conference, and uh, I liked him on first impression. He's a he's a defensive oriented coach um, who has some really in Fred Hoiberg's um, mind some really clever matchup zone ideas. He, in fact, was brought to Lincoln a year or two ago to give a presentation about his, his zone schemes and sort of what what they've done and and they wanted to pick his brain so he's not somebody who is just right uh just popped on to fred hoiberg's radar just like a few weeks ago this is somebody who knows assistant coach nate lenzer for a long time and actually armand gates uh, was a grad assistant at western kentucky uh well he was a well adam howard was a player there so this is not a deal where they're going to need a long runway to get to know each other. They know each other. And in fact, Nate Lenzer and Adam Howard have, you know, even during the season, they talked about how uh, they would send each other NBA clips and stuff like ideas that you might be able to incorporate into your team and things like that. So Fred Hoiberg says this was his number one guy all along. He believes he's well connected to some various recruits, both coming out of high school and in the portal. And so I think the biggest thing that is going to, and I'm not here to take shots at anybody who's not here anymore, 
Uh, but there is a difference here. This is a guy who's he's going to be in the film room with players that he recruits. He's going to be on the floor with them, and he's he's brought in here to be a developer and a defensive guy. And that is obviously something when you look at what was lacking in this team last year, um, they didn't have it. And Fred Hoiberg, I think, also believes they have some length on this roster where you could play a zone, and if it's a tricky type of zone, you could be pretty effective with your length and also maybe a better rebounding team than you've been. I, I had kind of wondered last year if, I mean, the – the defensive intensity was lacking at times. I, you know, Doc Sadler was in a, a different role that kind of limited what he could really do in terms of on court coaching. But the, the thing I wondered was, you know, when Nebraska kind of went back to the drawing board a little bit mid season and started having to tinker with its offense and, you know, started running things through Derek Walker more and, and kind of trying to find answers there. I kind of wondered if, those the, the time that they were spending having to do that stuff was actually you know taken away a little bit from what they're able to do defensively in terms of different looks and, and stuff like that because it, it just didn't ever seem like they, they were super cohesive last season and i think he i think this hire goes along with maybe the idea that they're also building a little bit more of a blue collar type of team um, or trying to, I think there's going to be some effort to do that. You know, what can you be a black and blue type team in the Big Ten um, that on a night where you only score 60 points, you can still pull it off because you're you're that type of, you know, defensive team where your guys buy into the idea we can win games on the road because defense travels. And so that's going to be Adam Howard's biggest assignment um, probably it, it, right off the bat. Do Fred, you, oh, go ahead. Uh, I was going to say, Fred, taught, are you, were you going to ask about Howard? I was going to change to something else there. Yeah, just a, kind of a real quick sort of follow-up because Matt Abdelmassa was essentially your GM. I mean, he went out and he collected your roster. Do you think this shifts more of an onus on, on the other two assistants to be more involved in recruiting? I mean, I don't, I don't know that Armin Gates and, and – whoever Nebraska's had, you know, before they made these changes, they haven't had to do a lot of recruiting. Do you think they changes how they will assemble a roster with some of those roles? I mean, yeah, I, I would assume it's going to be more of a group effort with recruiting. Um, that's, that's sort of my assumption off the bat. We're, I'm, we're still trying to figure it out. I don't want to act like I'm an expert on how everybody's assignment is going to be divvied up at this point. Uh, but the, the one thing you know is that it's a staff and I, honestly, a few weeks ago, we kind of thought, well, Armand Gates might not be here, you know, because uh, his brother was going to get a job elsewhere and there would be other opportunities. And now it kind of makes sense why it's uh, still as it is because they all know each other. I mean, it's a group where I think there should be a pretty good comfort level. Um, like it was Adam Howard's first day on Tuesday and they each took, they each had assigned individuals that they're supposed to work specifically on some fundamentals with. And um, Hoiberg said, it, you know, it was, he just, he was after it right away. I mean, it was a guy like, it, he might as well have been a guy in his probably his second or third year as a coach here, because um, I think he kind of knows what they want. And cause they're, they've, they've talked so much basketball to each other uh, even before this hire. I was going to ask what, what, Fred kind of had to say about the off season thus far, because they've had obviously Bryce going on to the NBA. Um, they've had some guys enter the portal. They've pulled some guys out of the portal. What, I mean, what did he kind of have to say to where they are so far and kind of reshaping this roster? I think what's interesting is he made no bones about that. They're actively recruiting the portal, which suggests that they don't think Right now, they're at their scholarship limit, but that tells you they, they think something's going to move. They're still waiting on Lat and Trey to announce publicly, and it kind of sounded like they didn't know for sure where those were both headed. Um, I think they would really love Trey, especially as you hear Adam Howard talk about you know d defense and like you're talking about your top defender. That's a piece you want right off the bat. So I think they'd love to have him back. And then, yeah, I don't know if there's going to be another spot or two that opens up. It's it. I got the feeling there is going to be because 
just the way that they're recruiting the portal, it, it seems like there's going to be space somewhere. Uh, Breidenbach is progressing, I guess, nicely. He's gained some weight, but he's still, um, you know, he's still kind of in the middle of that rehab. So they're, they're optimistic. He's going to be back for the season. Uh, but obviously that's going to be, you know, an off season story to monitor. And you hope that by like June, when Ramel Lloyd and those other guys come in here, that you've got your, your full uh, cast. And I also think Sam Grissell, um, Fred is really excited about him helping with the culture and also just like his versatility as a six, six guard. He likes the length and he just likes how big they are at each position now. I think we got a little bit of time here that we can sneak in some Nebraska baseball coming off of a three game sweep of Ohio state Bruns, How badly did Nebraska need a series to not only kind of go their way, but for them to sort of be the, the team that bludgeons another team's pitching staff, so to speak. Yeah, it was um, I probably from the coaching staff's point of view, a pretty welcome series. I mean, the, the Friday night game was pretty competitive. Um, Nebraska kind of squeaked it out, even though Ohio State committed, I think it was six errors in that game. Um, so, you know, Will Bolt challenged him to, to be more aggressive at the plate and his his players, to their credit. To be back, more aggressive at the plate. Well, I mean. It, I don't know it, they've lacked aggression. The the problem has been is when they've gotten guys in scoring position, they were watching a lot of pitches. And um, you saw it against Creighton last week where you basically have the table set to win the game in the seventh and eighth inning, and guys just are completely lost up there. So, you know, you, you come back, you have a good showing on Saturday against a decent pitcher. Sunday, you, you come out and, and put up 17 runs with, was it 13 of them coming with two outs? Um, that's that's good um you know it's, it's almost kind of like a shooter needing to see the ball go through the hoop a little bit um you know they had some guys step up that had been struggling a lot um you know luke sartori had a couple great catches on sunday hits a grand slam uh nick wimmers a, a juco transfer kind of comes off the milk carton and has a great weekend against ohio state and, and is a potential option now from the left side of the plate so that that's all good. And, you know, you, you kind of got, got some good feelings going into this week where you, you play Omaha on Wednesday, you have a home series against Rutgers who's leading the big 10 right now. And then you play 14 of your next 17 at home. So, um, you know, we, we kind of talked about, you know, Nebraska, maybe getting the ball rolling a little bit. This seems like an opportunity to do that with so many games at Haymarket park coming up. Is there anybody in particular that seems to be heating up for Nebraska? Uh, I mean, Max Anderson, finally. I mean, that that's a big one for him. I mean, he's he's uh, he hit a grand slam um, in it, it, over the weekend and has had just anecdotally much better at bats. He's hitting the ball well, even if he doesn't have anything to show for it. He hit one against Creighton that – probably in any other park in America is a home run, but he hit it uh, to, to right center dead into a wind and it died at the warning track. So um, I, I think getting him rolling is really important um, and, and getting some guys to, to get hot at the same time. Um, so it, it seems like it's starting to turn a little bit. I think they've figured out pitching roles a little bit better than, than what they had a few weeks ago. So cautiously optimistic that that perhaps better things are ahead for Nebraska baseball as they get into the meet a big 10 play here. Who who's kind of assumed some of the key bullpen roles for them. Look, if, if the game's on the line and you got to go to a reliever in the seventh or eighth inning, who's getting that call right now? Uh, well, I think they like what they have with Tyler Martin. If it's you know from the left side, he had a really nice relief appearance against Ohio State on Saturday, I think it was. Um, you know, I think they like what Emmett Olsen can be in, in high leverage situations. I think, too, that, you know, it, it, strangely, they hadn't had a, a, a save situation in almost a month. But, um, you know, Braxton Bragg, I think, is probably – uh, put his his name towards the front of the list for that role. He pitched twice um, in, in the ninth inning on, over the weekend against Ohio State. So, 
is he the perfect type closer like Spencer Schwellenbach was? No, probably not. But I think that they are a little bit closer to having those things figured out uh, than they were, you know, maybe even like a week and a half ago. So the, the, the question for Nebraska's pitching staff, I think, is can they get enough consistent starting pitching from guys who are not Shea Shannon? You know, Cody Frank has been okay at times. Dawson McCarvel's really struggled um, to, to get past the fourth inning uh, in his starts. So they just need a little bit more consistency and a little bit more, um, a little bit more length to some of those weekend starts because the Nebraska, while Nebraska's bullpen seems like it's going in the right direction, they still are a little bit thin there. All right, that should do it for us here at Husker 24-7. Uh, be sure to check out Husker247.com. Plenty of content going up there. There will be some recruiting coverage, obviously, over the weekend with visitors in, but there's a plan to have a recruiting podcast as well, dropping uh, maybe Friday on uh, when we get kind of an updated list and we know who's coming into town. We can dive through some of that stuff as well. So be sure to catch all of that and – Keep those ears open. The hype cast is coming. It's time for people to get hyped a little bit. You know, you got the spring game. They got seven defensive linemen. Who knows what we're going to see? We don't even know what the format is, but we're going to get you hyped for it. So you'll want to hear that as well.